Do you think of yourself as wealthy? Do you think of yourself as wealthy? I think often we get trapped in a mindset where we think of ourselves, our wealth, in comparison to those who are more wealthy than us. And so we, we think, oh, well, you know, we're comfortable, but we're not loaded. We think, oh, I'm, we're pretty well off, but my boss, man, he makes so much more money than I do, right? We, we're thinking about those who make more or have more, and we don't have that, so we mustn't be wealthy, One of the things about our Western mindset that we've been trained in since we're children is to be thinking about the next big purchase. We need to save up that money to buy that house or to replace the car. Or perhaps we're at a stage of life where we're thinking about that luxury item like that boat or caravan. Maybe you're, you're thinking about that next house renovation or the interior makeover. And because the world is trying to sell us stuff constantly, we can see others who are better off than us who have the things that we're, we might want to have one day, or we're, we're paying down the mortgage, we can't afford that big purchase right now. And so we think of ourselves as not being very rich because there are constraints upon us. But just because you can't go out and buy that new car out of pocket doesn't mean that you are not already incredibly wealthy. We need to have a reset in the way that we think about our wealth because we're thinking about it in comparison to those who are more wealthy than us, not about what we actually have under the blessing of God. But let me lay down some statistics for you. If you're a single person in Australia earning the average Australian wage, then you are earning 17 times more than the global median, even taking into account the cost of living in Australia. 17 times the global median. If you are a family of four and you earn a little over $60,000 annually, then you are in the top 20% of the wealthy in the world. A couple of weeks ago, I mentioned the superabundance that we enjoy right now in our present age. Back in uh, the Babylonian era, you had to work 41 and a half hours to get 1,000 lumen hours of light from a sesame seed oil lamp. So it's basically a week's worth of work to get a thousand lumen hours out of a lamp. By the 19th century, you had to work 14 minutes to get a thousand lumen hours of light. By 1992, you only had to work for four seconds to get a thousand lumen hours of light out of a, out of a fluorescent bulb. We just take for granted that we can go home and we can switch the lights on. And in fact, if we, we'll leave the lights on when we go out to make it look like somebody's home. You know, it's a security measure. You know, we're that wealthy that we can just afford to leave the lights on, leave the heater running. The fact that it's, it's relatively easy to heat and cool our homes, to just travel hundreds of, and thousands of kilometres just on a whim... The fact that we have so many appliances in our houses to do hard work on our behalf. We are incredibly wealthy. And you are wealthy just by virtue of being in Australia. Even if you lost everything today, imagine you, it all happened at once. You got fired, your house burned down, the car was in the garage, so it burned as well. Your family, for some reason, rejected you. And your savings account got hacked, and so you had no money. Even if all of that happened in one day, you could still most likely be able to get to a local charity and get some food, possibly get crisis accommodation, and then there is a whole stack of different types of emergency payments that the government gives to people in need. You can have food in stomach, roof over your head, and money in the bank within a relatively short period of time. You won't be rolling in cash, but you'll be able to get by. This is the reality of the place in which we live. And so what I want that to impress to you is that you are wealthy. You are wealthy. If you're not concerned about where your next meal is coming from, if you're in secure housing, if you have your sufficient clothes to be warm right now, then you are wealthy. If you have a box at home that automatically washes your clothes, you are wealthy. And so you're wealthy in the scheme of history 
as I mentioned, that super abundance over time with technology and, and things, there is, you're wealthy in the scheme of history. Solomon would, would bend over backwards to have some of the modern conveniences that you have in your home. You're wealthy in comparison to a lot of the world. Just the average, even a poor Australian is still much wealthier than a lot of people in the world. And most of us, I would say, are nowhere near the poverty line. We are wealthy, and I dare you to try and prove me wrong. So knowing this, what does this leave, where does this leave us now? What, what are we to do with this knowledge that we have been reminded of this morning? What does it have to do with God and church? Well, being wealthy comes with certain responsibilities. It comes with uh, a certain way of looking at the world. And there are certain temptations that come along with being wealthy. And so we're going to look at our passage, this last passage in Timothy this morning, where we get some specific instructions about how the wealthy are to respond to their position and place in the world. The first thing that the wealthy must do is to trust God and not in their wealth. Trust God and not wealth. In these last a couple verses of Timothy, this is Paul's final couple things that he needs to say to Timothy. Now, this is important. This is Paul, the apostle, a man who has met and learned from the risen Lord Jesus. This is a man who is instructing Timothy, who is a, like a second generation leader in the church in Ephesus. So this is early days in the church, but now this is getting to the stage where the apostles are passing on the leadership of the church to the next generation. And, Tim, and Timothy is being taught by the OGs, you know, the, by the, the guy who actually probably, I can't remember if he exactly planted the church in Ephesus, but he was certainly involved in getting the church of Ephesus off the ground. So Paul is giving Timothy what he needs to know. And remember, this is in an age before text messages and email and even regular post. So when you write a letter, you send it off, it could take months to get there. And so every bit of that letter is precious. Everything that is written down and sent out is important. They're not, he's not waffling on. The stuff that is in this letter is important, and this is important for Timothy to teach the church to trust God, not their wealth. Paul says to Timothy in verse 17, As for the rich in this present age, charge them not to be haughty, nor to set their hopes on the uncertainty of riches, but on God, who richly provides us with everything to enjoy. So, Timothy, as a church leader, was to teach this. The first thing I want to note here is that this is... Some, sometimes we get into a mindset of, of the, we go to church and the, we should just get taught about Jesus. But there's implications about belonging to Jesus, which influences and affects every part of our life. And so, we should expect leaders in the church, the people who are teaching us about Jesus, to teach us about the implications and how that filters down into our lives. And so, this is wholesale permission from Paul to say, hey, you got to teach on how people are to live in the world, how they are to do with their stuff, how they are to have what the attitudes that they are supposed to have to things like money. And what these rich are being charged to do is to not be haughty. I don't think that's probably a word that you use this week, but a word that might be more common that we, we might say, um, the rich are not to be high-minded. They're not to be proud in their wealth. So what does this mean? Well, for starters, it's kind of explained further on that it means not putting hopes on the uncertainty of riches. But being high-minded as a wealthy person, what might that look like? It might look like the, the cliché of the wealthy person looking down their nose at somebody who has less. Now, some people do are poor because of bad decisions they've made, but there are also a lot of people who are not. But even if somebody was poor because of the bad decisions they made, we still don't look down our noses at them because you are not better as a person because you have not made the same bad decisions. I'm sure you've made other bad decisions and gotten away with them. 
It's not about that. There's not, you, the wealth does not make you a better person than somebody else. And so just because you have wealth and somebody else doesn't, it's not a reason to look down your nose at them. But another way of being high-minded, being haughty with our wealth, is to be trusting in the wealth, to be trusting in things, to be trusting in our savings account, to be trusting in the, the assets that we have instead of in God. It's trusting in earthly wealth and effort and instead of in God. But instead of trusting in the wealth, instead of trusting in the things, we should trust in the one who provides the things, who, prov who made the world. We should trust in God, right? And so there's a, the attitude that we have as we come to the world with our wealth is not to say, oh, I've, got, I've got all the things I need, and now I'm set. So let's say, let's say you did, your house did burn down. Well, the, the, let me back up a bit. Let's say you paid off your house and you've got your house and you go, well, now I'm set. I'm set for retirement because I've got my house. I own it. And I, now I don't need to worry about that. But tomorrow a flood could come and wash it away. A fire could burn it down. The things of this world are temporary in that sense. So even though God made the world and the world is good, the physical world is a good thing. God made you an embodied being because he wants you to live in a physical world and he's going to recreate the world. So you will have a physical body in a physical world for eternity. But we're not to look at the world itself. We're not to trust in the world. We're meant to look to the Lord and to trust in him. He is the one who supplies all of the things that we enjoy. He is the one who is, remains even when the things of this world fade away, even when robbers break in and steal, hackers drain your, scam you out of your bank account. Even when all of those things can be stripped away, we trust in the Lord. We trust in God. And it might be that you get to live a, a, a life full of wealth and it is never taken away, but even so, you don't put the trust in the stuff. You don't put the trust in riches. Don't put the trust in your superannuation account for your retirement. Put your trust in God so that whether or not those things are there, you are still living in the blessing of the Lord. So it is wise for us to put away for your savings account, but don't trust in it. It is wise for us to invest, but don't trust in the investment. It is wise to, to thank God for your superannuation, but don't treat it like the solution to all of your future problems. Be thankful for your job, but don't be bitter if you lose it when there's a downturn in the economy or, or whatever. So enjoy the stuff, but trust God, because after all, it is given to us by God. He says, don't put um, your hope in the uncertainty of riches, but put your trust on God who gave the riches, who richly provides us with everything to enjoy. He has made a world in which we can enjoy it. There is wonderful things in this world that God made to be enjoyed and to glorify Him out of it, not to idolat be idolaters of the, of the things. So, these rich, we rich, need to turn our, our trust, our devotion, our loyalty away from the wealth, the things of this world, and put them in God. And how should we act? How should we act? What does it look like to stop trusting in the stuff? Well, it means being wealthy in good works. Being wealthy in good works, which is the next part of our passage, where Timothy is going to give, instruct, get instructions from Paul on what to do now. Don't have this attitude, but what do you do instead? Well, look in verse 18 and 19. They are to do good, be rich in good works. See the play on words there? The rich are to be rich in good works, to be generous and ready to share, thus storing up treasure for themselves as a good foundation for the future so that they may take hold of that which is truly life. So replace the haughtiness, replace the pride in the wealth with good works, with good action, with generosity, being ready to share with your wealth. And it's interesting here, the, the same root word that we have here with uh, ready to share is the same word that we get fellowship, right? 
So koinonia in the Greek. So you, get, you have fellowship with one another, right? When you share, when you share, uh, have a like-mindedness, when you share fellowship around a meal, when you share in Christ. And our wealth should have a similar effect. It should be we should be able to use it in fellowship, in sharing with one another. This is not trying to set up some communist utopia, but this is a, the when God has given somebody much and somebody else in God's providence has very little, then there is an opportunity there for the one with much to be, as it were, the hands of God in providing for those who have less. We should be ready to share. Generous. And so... This doesn't mean that we, if you, if, as wealthy people, we need to just give everything away because, it, after all, in order to be able to be generous, we need to have things to be able to give away. So it's okay to have stuff, but not to hold on to it, not to trust in it, to grab it, to have to, to keep it as if your life depended on it, as if your future happiness depended on it. We should instead be ready to give it away and trust that God will provide what we truly need. We are to be rich in good works. To be overflowing in good works. As it were, to have a bank account full of good works. Right? And when we do this, when we share, when we have a generosity, when we are willing to share what we have, we are in some sense, we are mimicking God himself. Who gives graciously, who gives abundantly, who has given you all the wealth that you have enjoyed this very day. He has given it to you as a blessing, right? You don't need to turn around and say, oh, well, I've got to, I've got to pay God back for everything he's given me. Although it is honoring to say, Lord, because of what you've done for me, I want to do something to, in honor of you in return. But he just gives it. He just gives it. He's given you life and breath for all these years. He's given you the food. He's given you the job. Yes, you work hard, but the Lord has actually made the world in which we plant seed in the ground and the, and the plants grow. He's given you the very fabric of the world that you use and mold for your benefit. The Lord has given you all, and He has given us the greatest gift of all, which is Jesus Christ, our Lord, our Savior. He pours out grace and mercy on His people through Jesus Christ. He has given you the atoning sacrifice that you need to be reconciled back to God because we've been separated from him by sin. And so when we're generous, we're mimicking this generosity of God that he would give of himself for the sake of others. He would give out of love. And so we should copy that in giving out of love. But when it comes to this generosity and giving out of love, we remember that we give out of love to there is what you might say, ordered loves, right? The Proverbs tell us that um, a good man leaves an inheritance to his children's children, but the sinner's wealth is laid up for the righteous. So even though we are called to be generous, like we read earlier in Timothy, there are still obligations that we have towards those in our family, let's say, to provide for our older relatives. This doesn't mean you take what should like these, um, the Pharisees were trying to trick people into doing, I'll give your money to the, to the temple that you would have otherwise used to support your family in their old age. They, it's called korban. This money I would have given you to support my family in their old age, I'm giving it to the temple. And, and Jesus, of course, uh, reprimanded them for that because they were undermining the commandment to honor your mother and father in order to give money to the church. So don't, so don't do that. When you're being generous, it doesn't mean steal from your family or the future generations in order to do something that feels spiritual in the moment. So there's wisdom in how we do this. But I'm telling you now, we have such an abundance of all kinds of other things. Don't just be thinking about money. We have such an abundance that we can afford to give so much away and still be thinking about providing for the future and the future generations, providing for others that we need to support Think of your wealth like a tool to be used for God's glory in serving people, your own family first and your spiritual family out, out, out of that, and then the wider community and country. Use your wealth to lay up everlasting assets, storing up treasure for themselves for eternity. 
It's as though we're it's as though we are investing in eternity when we use our wealth, when we use our gifts and abilities to serve the Lord. Now, one of the ways I want you to think about how you do this is if you reach a point where you no longer need to work to make ends meet. For many of us, this comes at retirement, where we stop working full-time, where we've got our super and our pension or whatever, and we can, we can get by. And so no longer do we need to work a nine-to-five but now you have a, this. This is a, still a point of wealth, right? It, it is a, you are wealthy if you can afford to not go to work and still have your needs met. And so when we retire, it's not as though we are to kick back our feet and not work anymore. Now you should use this wealth of time to serve the Lord. Maybe your body's not going to be at it. You're not going to be able to work as hard as you used to uh, when you were a little bit younger. But still, you should use the wealth of time that you now have to serve the Lord, to serve others. We work for an eternity, not just for a cushy retirement here. We are yearning and seeking, we're serving the Lord with all that we have. And it's as though we are, we are working out our salvation and we are grasping hold of the eternal life, the life eternal, with the way that we act and live out in this world. And in the last part of our passage, and indeed the last part of, our, of this book, we get a final closing charge to Timothy, a charge to guard the deposit of the gospel, to guard the deposit of the gospel. This is the last words that, that Timothy receives from Paul in this letter, in verse 20 and 21. O Timothy... He dresses him specifically. Guard the deposit entrusted to you. Avoid the irreverent babble and contradictions of what is falsely called knowledge. For by professing it, some have swerved from the faith. And grace be with you all. So this is a charge to a young church leader in what he is to do. Some final instructions. Guard the deposit entrusted to you. And so, what application would this have for us here this morning? Well, if you are prospectively uh, thinking about the future and becoming a church leader, well, this is something that you specifically need to be able to do, to guard the deposit entrusted to you. But there is some sense in which all of us are responsible to stick with the deposit we've received in the gospel. So, even if you're not going to be a church leader like Timothy was there is still a sense in which we need to stick with the truth and not be led astray by false teaching. What is this good deposit? Well, we're still using this metaf- these metaphors of wealth here, right? It is that idea of like, if you were thinking about a house deposit, right? You know, it's a, it's an, it's a valuable something that has been entrusted, that has been, needs to be kept. But this is not kept in the sense of, Timothy, you need to hide it away. This is something valuable that is to be shared, but you need to protect it so that it's not stolen away, like the gospel being stolen away because it's been hidden under false teaching. It's a treasure that needed to be guarded. And this reminds me of the first guard. I don't know, do you know, does anybody know who the first guard in the Bible was? This is a bit obscure, but I'm I'm asking, what's that? I I missed that. The cherubim? Close. But there was even one before the cherubim that guarded the way to the tree of life. Adam himself was given the job to keep and work the Garden of Eden. Now, that word keep, keep has in it the idea of maintenance, right? But it also holds in it the idea of guarding the garden. Adam was the first, um, you might say, warrior priest, like the Levites who had come after him. He was meant to keep and work the garden. He was meant to look after it. He was meant to be a priest to that temple place where people would meet with God. And what did he do? He did not guard it. But instead, the serpent came into the garden and he let the serpent come in and he let the serpent deceive his wife. 
And so he failed in his duty to keep the garden, to protect the garden. And now, by God's grace, we have a second Adam who has come. And after Adam's failure meant us being disunited from God, we have a second Adam who has come and has restored us into fellowship with God, who has brought us back and reconciled us with God. And so now it is though we are back with God and we now have what we had lost and it needs to be protected still. It is a message, the gospel, it is this good news of being reconciled to God, it is this truth that needs to be handed on and kept pure so that it is not lost and we are not alienated from God because it is only by and through Jesus Christ that we can be reconciled to God. It is the most valuable thing in the world, the gospel. It needs to be kept free from strange ideas, irreverent babble that confuses people, contradictions of what is falsely called knowledge. There must be a distinction between truth and falsehood, and so we must guard the good deposit. And so, what does that look like? It means not getting sucked into the latest theological trends. In Timothy's day, he was seeing the formulation of um, all kinds of false teachings that pop up in response to the gospel. Now, in the second century, there was this thing that came that was called Gnosticism. So, Gnostic um, heresies, you might have heard of Gnostic heresies. And that was famously, a lot of that stuff really came into full shape in the second century. But here in the first century, where Paul is writing to Timothy, we're probably seeing some of the threads of that what would later be called Gnosticism, already starting to affect the church. And, and, of, and the, the Greek word for knowledge is gnosis. So that's how we get Gnosticism. And so here we have Paul already warning about people who come around and say they've got this special gnosis, they've got this special knowledge that you need in order to truly know God or to get the truth or to truly understand how the world works. So we're probably seeing start of the some of the threads of that starting to come into fruition. It tends to be syncretistic, where people take other ideas and they mix them in with the truth of the gospel. They'll take, in that day, it could have been platonic ideas or ideas about asceticism, you know, the world bad, physical world bad, spiritual world good, so reject this, the physical world. Taking ideas from out there and trying to mix it in with Christian ideas and, and put a Christian or shine on it. And that has been an issue down through the ages of people wanting to mix in other ideas with the gospel and say, oh, look, this is the true knowledge that you need. But Timothy's been warned not to get sucked away. Guard the good deposit, reject these irreverent babble, reject the things that actually contradict the gospel, reject this false knowledge. Why? Because this stuff leads people astray. By professing it, some have swerved from the faith. Now, there's been heresies all through the ages of various types and shapes and sizes. But in our present day, there has actually been an increase in a, like a new Gnosticism. And what do I mean by this? I, I credit Vody Bockham with uh, pointing it out to me. He's pointed out the idea that in the world, uh, some people think get into this mindset of thinking that you need to have a certain experience or have been a certain type of person in order to have a particular insight. So what do I mean by this? So you might, it, it can be casual, you know, where like a, a, a married person, or let's flip it around, a single person who's been single over many years is getting wisdom and advice from a married person and the single person says, well, you don't know what it's like to be single for many decades, so you can't really speak to my situation, right? And so there's this assumption here that because you haven't lived my experience, that somehow you don't have the special knowledge to be able to speak to my situation. And it comes in all forms and shapes and sizes. You'll, you know, people, a married person saying to a single person, you'll understand when you get married. And sure, there is gained experience the experiential knowledge, but it doesn't disqualify people from having true wisdom from God and sharing that wisdom with you or pointing out sin in your life 
and encouraging you to be faithful in whatever situation you're in. But it doesn't, it goes beyond that kind of like the, that, that, uh, you know, whatever state of life you're in, old, young, these kinds of things. But we're seeing it seep into the world in such a way that people think, well, a man can't speak into my situation because I'm a woman. You see, because you don't have the special knowledge, you can't know fully the truth. But it goes beyond that. And it goes into other things like, well, because you haven't experienced what it's like to be disabled, you can't speak into my life. And we're seeing this pervasive across the world. And so the more kind of victim categories that you can be in, or more special categories then that you are in, the, somehow the more special knowledge you have about the world. And this has seeped into things like even in, in Christian theology, there's, there's, it's not really theology, but there's things like, um, there's things like black theology, where somehow because of the amount of melanin in somebody's skin because they have more melanin in their skin and because they've had a certain experience of being a certain ethnicity in a certain country, that somehow they have a different kind of knowledge to bring to theology. Do you see how this is this kind of idea of where you have to have the special knowledge in order to understand something truer about the world? But that's not how God wants it. That's not how God has delivered His Word. He doesn't give us His Word and say, well, if you belong to this particular group or have this particular experience, somehow you understand more of God's Word, or understand more of God's character. That's not how it works. God, for instance, God doesn't have a problem. He doesn't say when He says appoint church leaders, He says, make sure you get an age, a spread of age and a spread of different experiences. And no, He says they need to have these qualifications, character qualifications, ability qualifications and so I want you to be on the lookout for those who this mindset you might not even realize you've been affected by it where you think where you're thinking well we need we need these particular people in in parliament because they will represent us and they will have the special knowledge in order to really lead the country well or other things like that or in your in your in the way that we run our schools, in the way that we have institutions in our society. One of the applications of this is that you don't need a women's study Bible. You don't need uh, the Bible to be taught by preachers who've experienced all the same things that you have experienced. There's no special knowledge to be uncovered in the Scriptures based on characteristics like somebody's gender or ethnicity or marital status or what if they've experienced the same thing as you and another one of the ones that's popped up that has been increasingly popular is this idea that one needs to have the the experience or mindset of a modern day Jew in order to understand the scriptures which is a falsehood that's another Gnostic heresy coming in because somehow we're attributing to the modern day Jew some kind of special knowledge that they have that one must gain in order to understand the scriptures which is not how that's not that's not how God wants his gospel to go forth he didn't say take my word into the world but make sure you make sure you have the mindset of a modern day Jew in order to understand the Bible that's a that's a Gnostic heresy so be on your guard for those who would lead you astray and say Oh, look, we've discovered some new truth. If you just have this attitude, or if you just look at the, the Bible this way, then somehow you will gain a greater truth or understanding. Be on your guard for those who would say, Oh, look, we've rediscovered the truth. You have the basics, but now you need to come and hear the special truth that has been kept from you. If somebody comes to you claiming to represent the Christian faith, we should expect to find that faith being handed down through the ages. Yes, we are a mixed multitude. Yes, there are heresies that have had different holds in the church throughout the years. But basically, if somebody comes up to you and says, oh, look, we've rediscovered the true faith of the apostles that they haven't known in the last 2,000 years, you should have a lot of alarm bells going off in your head. Christ has been preserving and purifying his bride down through the angels. There are up times and there are down times, but it's not as though the faith has been hidden and is just now being uncovered. So be on your guard. Guard the deposit that has been entrusted to you and don't be tricked, don't be deceived.
by those who would come and say, oh, you need this special knowledge. And then Paul closes with these last words, grace be with you. And the, the you there is in the plural. So we need to pull out our Texan accents. Grace be with you all. You know, grace be with you all. So this is obviously him passing on his final greeting, you would say, to Timothy as he closes out his letter. All right. So what? What is this? Where does this leave us? It leaves us with three main things. That we as the wealthy of this age need to trust God, not our wealth, not the labors of our hands, not our assets, not our bank accounts. Don't trust in the things of this world. Trust God. Be thankful for the wealth. Enjoy the things that he's given, but trust him. And be wealthy in good works. Be ready to share. Be generous. Use what God has given you in order to serve him. Guard the good deposit that has been trusted to us. Don't let anyone lead us astray and trick us. Because this is where true wealth is. This is the most valuable thing in the world, the good deposit that we've received. Jesus Christ himself given to us in the flesh. Find true wealth in God, not in the world. Let me close in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you have given us all good things to enjoy. We thank you, God, that you have given us the greatest blessing, the greatest wealth of all, which is yourself given to us in Jesus Christ and in filling us with the Holy Spirit. Please, Lord, help us to use the good things of this world that you've given us to serve you, not to trust in them, not to put our loyalty and, and, and anchor our future in them, but instead to look to you and to rely on you and using the things of this world to glorify you. Lord, make us more generous. Make us more full of good works. Please, Lord, inspire and encourage and push us towards um, being ready to share all that we have with others. Give us wisdom to know how to do this well, not to squander what you have given. And Lord, please keep us from being deceived by the, 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 the tasty morsels that intrigue us, by the things that would scratch, the messages that would scratch our itching ears. Lord, please keep us and help us to avoid the reverent babble, to avoid the false knowledge uh, that others would bring in order to deceive us and lead us away from the true faith. Lord, we thank you that you keep and protect your church and that you are washing your bride, that you are preparing her. We thank you for all that you have done in Jesus' name. Amen.